All right, welcome everybody to the panel. Um, I look forward to hearing even more what uh, folks have to say. So I'd like to welcome our executive director, Edna Rodriguez, and um, the other panelists to turn their video and sound on and they can take it away. Great, thank you, Justine. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. Uh, this is the first come to the table that we've done virtually. So this is a new experience for us. So uh, bear with us. So far, everything is going smoothly. Um, this panel today is focused on owning our food future. And we have uh, Dr. Wilson joining us again for this panel, as well as Ray uh, Jeffers and one of our board members, Claire Calloway. Um, owning our food future, and what does that mean? Um, the work that we do at RAFI is focused on food justice, and much of that work is working to advocate for policies that better support farmers, as well as providing services and resources for farmers. And come to the table, we're focused on food security and food access. Um, so this term owning our food future can mean different things depending on which part of the, of the work that you're doing. So some of the things that come to mind, I made a quick list and had to shorten it because it was a lot, are corporate control of our food system and corporate consolidation, the importance of local food markets, something that we saw during COVID at uh, the beginning, particularly, equitable land access um, and land loss, which was discussed earlier, the concept of self-determination, freedom, and the ability to produce food and food production as a form of empowerment. And generally the right to food and food is a human right. And then finally food sovereignty, which I think encompasses all of those. So I'm going to pass it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. If you could uh, share your name, who you're with, your role, and then maybe a little bit about what this um, term owning our future future means to you. And we'll start with Dr. Wilson. Okay. Hi, every Hi everyone. Um, notice I just froze there for a moment. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you all again. Um, I'm Norbert Wilson. I am a faculty member at Duke University and the Divinity School and the School of Public Policy. And I also uh, work with the World Food Policy Program at Duke. Um, I am uh, here in Durham, North Carolina, but as I mentioned earlier, I've been here about a year and a half. So I'm, I, I don't know the state very well. I'm trying to get to know it, but it's been difficult during the pandemic. Um, my, my engagement with um, food issues or food policy um, stems out of the work I do currently on food insecurity. Um, but I, before this, I, I used to do a lot of work on um, international trade and food safety issues. And so I've seen it as sort of at a broader um, international level, but also um, more focus on domestic issues. Um, what do I think owning our food future means? Is, is that the question that I need to address? Yeah, I, I think it's an opportunity for um, all individuals to be able to have access to food um, and, and food that, that fits their lives um, and not just something that's given, um, but something that is a product of uh, one's own ability to produce. I do believe that uh, food is communal. So I'm, I, I don't mean to suggest that we're sort of independent and we don't need one another, but rather this idea of a shared vision um, that reflects our, our experiences of how to access food. Um, so when I think about these issues, I'm thinking about what are the policies that promote that opportunity for individuals to be able to determine what foods they want or even what foods they want to share with their community, with their family. Um, how do we create a, a food environment that is one that we want to share with our, our offspring, um, be it their own, our own children or just people in our community who represent a future generation. So those are some of the things I think about when I think about the idea of owning our food future. Wonderful, thank you. Claire, do you wanna go next? Yeah, uh, so my name is Claire Kellaway. Uh, I am the program manager for Fair Food and Farming Systems at the Open Markets Institute. I'm calling in from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I focus on you know, studying and reporting on corporate consolidation in the food system and also policies to mitigate that corporate power and promote a more democratic, democratic economy. And so when I think about owning the food future, I think both very literally about um, who are the entities that own, you know, critical 
assets, land, infrastructure, retail, um, and how that affects everyone else in the food supply chain. But I also think about control and again, democracy. What are the levers that people have to voice their opinion over the ways that corporations and other kinds of businesses operate? Um, you know, there are many different ways besides literal ownership that the public can have a broader say in shaping their food system. And so those are the kind of policies that um, I'm interested in. Wonderful, thank you, Claire, Ray? Hi, I'm Ray Jeffers, uh, policy and program manager uh, here at RAFI and RAFI is located in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, though I am calling in today from Roxborough, North Carolina, Person County. Uh, I'm a, also a small producer here in the county, operating my family century farm. And I guess when I think about food security, uh, it's just that kind of like what Dr. Wilson said, access, secure, security for our community. Um, and, you know, basically what we're going to talk about here today, kind of owning that. And, um, and those small producers like myself can't feed the world. We definitely could take care, I think, our region and our community. And, uh, and we need to kind of Get towards that and think we're going to talk about that today. Wonderful. Thank you, Ray. So um, let's get started with our first question um, for each of you. And you can, whoever wants to go first can jump in. What barriers do you see that keep farmers and others from owning our food future? And who are the people, organizations, or corporations that currently control food and its future? I don't mind kicking us off because um, I imagine I'd probably be quite big picture. Um, but yeah, I mean, quite literally, I see how a large handful of corporations closely control much of the food supply chain in ways that, um, you know, block access to at least mainstream markets for community based businesses and also limit choices um, for farmers and consumers. So just a few stats um, to frame this. There are only four corporations that sell more than 60% of all seeds in the world. Uh, those same four corporations also sell more than 80% of the world's agrochemicals um, and you know, often pair their seeds to withstand the chemicals that they sell. Uh, in the US, just six companies uh, control two thirds of all meat production, one large co-op controls a third of the U.S. raw milk supply and just four stores sell 40% of all groceries with Walmart alone claiming um, one in every four dollars spent on groceries. So this all concentrates the wealth that can be derived from food production into the hands of a few businesses, but it also concentrates, you know, decision making around how to feed the world um, into a few large and powerful businesses that are, I think, critically built around the short-term interests of financial institutions, typically, uh, instead of the public interest. And that creates a whole host of environmental and economic social problems, um, you know, too much to cover to some extent in this quick uh, walkthrough. But I mean, the pandemic alone really shows how these concentrated food systems failed to feed people, whereas, you know, community groups like many who are participating in this conference today really stepped up and, and filled those needs. Um, and so what that means, you know, for the topic of this panel, you know, owning the food, food future and um, for community control, you know, this concentration limits um, for instance, farmers' ability to exercise choice in picking their seeds and inputs and, you know, what they grow. It limits choice in where they can sell their products and how they can get their products in front of certain customers or access certain mainstream markets. Um, it limits, you know, economic opportunity to to start a business when people are trying to compete against these Goliaths who have really, again, cornered access to markets. Um, but I think perhaps like most distressingly, this concentrated corporate wealth really translates into political power and influence over regulators, which shuts off 
you know, another vehicle that communities have to voice their concerns and leverage public power to hold these entities accountable. Um, and so that is what I see as, you know, there are very literal sort of business, um, you know, barriers and issues that corporation, the corporate power um, creates. But I think there's also the question of political power that is sort of existential in terms of um, blocking people's ability to, to shape the food future. I guess I can come in a little bit and talk a little bit from the kind of the farmer's perspective and maybe touch a little bit on what Claire was talking maybe with the political. You know, most farmers in America today are struggling. Farmers comprise uh, around about 1.5% of our population, a percentage that continues to trend downward as young people see um, little opportunity to, to make a living. Farmers with differing approaches, farm sizes and markets are facing stagnant prices, rising costs, difficult finding labor and mounting debts. Um, in desperation, a lot of farmers are turning to suicide. We all know that rate is, is unfortunately increasing uh, in this country. You know, four companies produce 85% of all the beef 60% of our US poultry market, and three companies control 61% of our pork market. And just to put that in somewhat kind of perspective for the consumer and the farmer, for one pound of flour calculated at a cost of five pound bag, retailing at 88 cents a pound, the farmer only receives 39 cents. For one pound of bread retailing at $1.90, farmer receives 11 cents. Uh, for cereal retailing at 266, farmers receive five cents. For one pound of top sirloin steak retailing at 10.49, ranchers receive $1.90. One pound of boneless ham, 4.99 to the consumer, the farmer, 64 cents. One pound of bacon, $6.03, 64 cents for the farmer. Gallon of milk, 3.89, $1.78 to the farmer. And it goes on and on and on. And farmers are fighting an uphill battle to realize that, uh, you know, to try to realize those agricultural dreams that they've set for themselves. Anyone establishing new business has hurdles to overcome, but when you toss in unhelpful government policies, access to land prices, unaffordable capital, and physical demanding work into the mix, a new level of challenge um, uh, shows itself. You know, farmers are often beholden to the political machine of government willing and dealing. The final version of uh, the U.S. Farm Bill is a huge part of that. And it's not always good news for farmers working in sustainable agriculture. That's why it's important for so many of us to stay involved and advocate on behalf of the farmer. You know, we don't want to see uh, more conservation programs cut and higher subsidies for those big four mentioned earlier. Um, land access is, is a, a huge challenge for farmers, especially young farmers. Uh, a person setting out to start a new business as a first career, they typically don't have the cash in hand to, to purchase land on their own. Uh, with farmland prices per acre around major U.S. markets steadily rising to tens of thousands of dollars, the probability of being an owner operator near the most profitable market outlets is significantly low. Leasing has been a viable option for many, but in terms of stability and longevity to the farm business, ownership remains the goal uh, for most farmers. And the major barrier to owning land is what we, you know, the affordability gap. This is the difference between a property's fair market value and its agricultural value. Farmers are competing for farmland with, um, with estate clients, those looking to buy a second home in the countryside with no interest in farming. And uh, this is why prices continue to rise. Land trusts have been stepping up to turn that tide uh, kind of acre to acre, but through conservation easements, restrictions, uh, who can buy the conservation properties, and other programs allow farmers to sell their land to make it more affordable at a more affordable rate to um, other working farmers. But to purchase that land, some still have the issue of access to credit. Farmers need to seek out loans in order to get their new business off the ground. Um, they, and they meet another roadblock there. Without that credit and business history to back them up, a farmer, especially a young farmer again, uh, they're just too big of a risk uh, to a traditional lender to take on that. And you know, a lot of this came forefront um, through the pandemic uh, with the whole consolidation that we see with, with our ag market. Um, three events stand out um, over the years. First was the large Tyson food plant in Kansas that closed for four months following a fire uh, in 2019. Then of course we had the COVID-19 uh, COVID spread throughout the uh, last few years that impacted several slaughterhouses nationwide. 
And then in 2021, JBS um, detected a ransomware attack that shut down their plant. And you know what did that affect? 35 million cattle are slaughtered in the U.S. annually by 60 major beef packing operation processing uh, facilities that process around 26 billion pounds of beef owned by those four industries or those four companies, JBS USA, Tyson Foods, Cargyle, and National Beef Packing Company. So when you see those large plants close and meat supplies tighten while ranchers get stuck with cattle that would otherwise be slaughtered, that means the price of cattle generally falls while the price of meat and supermarkets rise, leading to limits on consumers, purchasing at grocery stores and decline in frozen inventories that processes have yet to replenish. So kind of gloom on, on the barrier, but I think <laughs> we're working to, to hopefully, if not find the solution, a solution. Wow, these are amazing answers to this question and I really appreciate it. Um, and I, I uh, Brother Jeffers, I wish I wish you had answered the question earlier when someone asked about how do we expand land ownership? You, 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 you really uh, extended that idea um, and thinking about ways of access, helping folks access it. Um, that could uh, allow for a broader group of folks to own land. And I, I'm really appreciative of the idea of the corporation uh, concentration. And actually, I, I talk about this in some of my coursework. And so this is a, there are critical questions, and, and we know it to be a problem. And, and, and we know that there are some real challenges associated with that type of ownership. Um, and I appreciate the, the focus on um, the parts of the supply chain uh, on the farmers and on the retail side and the ownership side. I, I, I want to turn our focus a little bit on the consumers themselves um, and thinking about who's struggling to access food. And, and granted, I did just give a presentation talking about food insecurity, but one of the things I think is critical to understand thinking about this entire space of who has access to food and who controls their food future. I think it's it's critical for us also to consider what happens to individuals, especially individuals from low-income households who are struggling to meet their food needs. Um, we saw in the, the, the previous uh, year uh, expansions of SNAP to help address issues of food security for families that were struggling. Um, and, and this effort of, of trying to help individuals meet that need um, was even boosted further by an expansion of the um, benefits that were uh, permitted through the uh, SNAP program because of a change in what's called the Thrifty Food Plan. The Thrifty Food Plan represents the least cost diet, uh, a least cost diet that is nutritionally adequate. And there was a sort of, and that amount is used to set the, um, the amount of benefits for households uh, in the SNAP program. The Biden administration actually adjusted that and allowed for a greater um, sort of benefit to be provided to families. And this was a critical way of helping families adjust to not only the pandemic, but also just the economic realities that we're facing right now. We are facing um, uh, an inflationary period that we haven't seen in decades. And these higher food prices are going to have significantly negative effects on the individual's ability to meet food needs. Um, today, and um, into the future, um, the conflict that we're seeing right now in the Ukraine and this effect on um, food prices, but also what that may mean for oil, but it's not just conflict there. There may be conflicts in other places that are also significant um, that I wanna acknowledge, but the point is we're going to see, we are seeing uh, higher prices. And again, families that are struggling with food access are gonna struggle even harder. And therefore there's a need for food policies that are in place to help those families meet their, need, uh, their needs. And so that can come through things like the SNAP program, which I, I wanna encourage and support, but they can also have implications for how the charitable food sector works in that space. But to address the issues of food and food access and not to think about the larger economic well-being of individuals is sort of missing the point. Um, food insecurity is definitely about food, but it's not only about food. So when we think about these issues, and I know we're thinking about food and agriculture, we also need to have this broader notion of what are the support policies that help families in need? Um, they may be farm families, they may be rural, they may be urban, but the point is all of these families are in need of support. And so I think we need to think critically about those individuals and how they're able to access food and what kinds of support programs are we providing from federal and state agencies, but also from community agencies or organizations to meet those food needs. 
So I hope that consumers are able to meet their food future, um, but I also acknowledge that there are policies that may not uh, be sufficient in meeting those needs, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and we need to find ways of helping support not only those policies, but also community actions to encourage um, and support families in need. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Um, my next question is a two-part qu question, which I'm actually gonna split into two, despite the instructions we were given. Um, and that first one um, is, what do you think needs to happen in order to shift power and control uh, to local communities uh, and consumers? And I'll pass it actually back to Dr. Wilson. Um, I love how y'all ask these really big questions and, and you're like, oh, just go talk. Um, what do we need to do to shift power? I, you know, oddly enough, um, maybe not oddly, I actually do believe in uh, the democratic, democratic process. Um, I do believe there's the, the, the role that voters can play um, in influencing um, the outcomes of um, policymakers and who's in, on, in, in power. So I would say it is through um, it is through the vote. It is through encouraging our policymakers to think critically and carefully about these issues. And I know that there are a number of challenges that we see regularly about who has access to voting rights and and concerns about um, our elections. And um, all of those concerns do trouble me. Um, and I think we need to be aware as citizens what's happening and, and having a voice and making sure our policymakers understand these concerns and having clear and critical analysis that allows us to actually parse out what is truly happening um, so that we're not being sort of swayed by um, voices that want to encourage um, um, dissent. So educating citizens to actively engage our political process to move us forward is a, what I think are, is a critical way of helping us, if you will, rest back uh, this control. Dr. Wilson, I think you make a, a, a great point there. And, you know, myself as a former local official and kind of policymaker in that, in that local level, I think another challenge is to make sure that um, people see it as a problem. And a lot of times uh, they don't, or they think it's not where I live. And you know, I, I saw that quite a bit uh, through my years in office. When you talk about you know things like food security, food deserts, or homelessness, or affordable housing, whatever the issue, no one that no, no one really thinks that affects them, or in, it's it's oh, it's not here, it's not in my hometown. And then of course you have that urban rural divide. But of course we see these issues. Uh, you know, this issue is not an urban or rural issue. You know, a lot of times, especially like even in the rural communities, when economic uh, opportunities like jobs and things like that are lacking a little more in the urban area, um, you see these issues with food security and um, and access, uh, especially to local. And so I think you, you hit the nail on the head with the voters. But again, those voters have to understand or have to have to um, agree that one, it's a problem, uh, and then they get the ear of the policymakers to start affecting positive change. Yeah, um, no, I think this is all great. And I definitely wholeheartedly agree that uh, a lot of this can be addressed through um, policy, you know, voicing um, democratic opinion and also organizing. Uh, and I guess one big picture thing, especially when it comes to corporations that I focus on from the policy perspective, um, I mean, I think, you know, my main goal is vesting control over the food system back into communities away from financial interests. And there's a ton of different ways we can do that. Uh, but I think, you know, if you come to my workshop that we're gonna be hosting tomorrow, one thing we'll be talking about is sort of forgotten history of how it's really the public through the state that allows corporations to exist at all by granting them corporate charters. Um, and that's just one example of how generally speaking, I think we need to revive just public control over corporations. And, you know, that's an idea that was once built into many of our legal systems and the remnants of that are really still there. Some would even argue that the US constitution itself recognizes that oligarchy and concentrated corporate power is a threat to democracy. And so there's a lot of different um, 
underused levers that we have from antitrust policy, which I study that can literally break up these concentrations of power, but also sort of set fair competition rules, um, banning things that are called unfair methods of competition, things like deceptive advertising, you know, discrimination, commercial bribery, really trying to get businesses to compete on the basis of good service and innovation instead of, you know, cheating or abuses of power, which is what we see a lot of businesses use to maintain their dominant market position today. But, you know, I'm also thinking about um, what Dr. Wilson was saying about, you know, food inflation and this is a huge issue, you know, right now. And at the same time, as food prices are going up, we're also seeing record corporate profits. This isn't necessarily a situation where the rises in food prices are just a reflection of increased costs of business. Certainly there are legitimate increased costs of business, but we wouldn't expect corporate profits to rise um, if that was the only factor here. And we're seeing executives admit on earnings calls that they're raising prices because they can, because consumers are accepting it and because they're not seeing a decrease in sales. And, you know, there is almost an implicit um, sort of inevitability to the way that's presented. But I think we need to remember that this doesn't have to be the case. You know, there are parts in history where we've enacted you know, taxes on excise corporate profits in times of crises, for instance. Um, this That's just one example of, you know, the many, many different policy levers that exist to really set the terms of trade, you know, set how businesses are operating and ensure that they're operating in the public interest, in this case, ensuring that everyone has um, access to affordable and healthy food. Thank you, Claire. Um, next question. How can those of us who are listening today get involved in making change? And I want to specifically ask what you think churches specifically can do. Whoever wants to go first. I'll, I'll take a stab at it uh, <laughs> to, to get us off. Um, well, first, I think is it's obviously let's, let's get involved. Um, I know, uh, Edna, you want us to speak to the churches a little bit, and I'll get to that point. But from the individual standpoint, like Dr. Wilson said, vote, vet those candidates, understand who, do you, who you're supporting and what they support. Um, obviously, you could donate to organizations like RAFI. They're <laughs> doing the work. I thought I'd put that plug in there. <laughs> but, you, you know, <laughs> you can just get involved, start advocating. Uh, get get involved with organizations like ours and others that are working in this area and specifically for churches. And I can only speak for my community and I'm heavily involved um, in the leadership in my church and, and, and the mission and what we do in the community. But um, again, from that local, former local official perspective, you, we don't see the church involvement in the communities quite like we used to. And I don't know why that is or why the step back, but um, and again, I'm only speaking kind of from my little community here in Person County. So if any Person County folks uh, are here, they can talk to me about it later. But we, we don't quite see that involvement like we used to in the churches. You know, um, the food banks, the food drives, the uh, clothing drives, the whatnot, the, you know, whatever it was to help kind of affect your community. And then, you know, there's a church almost in every little bit, every little crevice or community uh, in your county. And so if we could get them involved. Just imagine the impact uh, that you can have just in your in your local area or your region. Thanks, yeah, I, guess I would um, really second that. That you know, churches of uh, other um, you know places of worship uh, can definitely be centers of community organizing and um, connecting, and that can be you know. I think we often envision faith communities as like participating in literal service, but I think there's also like historically a really important role in community organizing. Generally, um, I think there's really inspiring interfaith uh, organizing groups out there pushing really important policy changes at the state and federal level. And that is a great entry point to, you know, reach different people on 
explicitly moral grounds, you know, and um, yeah, perhaps uh, motivate and engage um, people in different ways. And then, you know, broadly speaking, um, I guess I'd be remiss to say, in addition to a lot of this, you know, explicit policy work, uh, there are also things that individuals, you know, can do in terms of, um, you know, labor organizing, organizing your workplace is one way to create democratic institutions within some of these business and larger corporate structures. Uh, and then we see similar ways that farmers historically have formed cooperatives and really worked together um, to provide an alternative to the corporate form in the form of a cooperative or also form marketing cooperatives to bargain with concentrated buyers and sellers. And I think this is a really hopeful and uh, innovative business alternative that um, has proven success uh, over, over the years. And that's another area for policy where the USDA has significantly decreased its uh, cooperative um, technical assistance and funding. There also could just be much more capital and direct um, funding for cooperatives. So I think that's uh, another important part of this sort of democratic economy equation that I think we need to consider. Maybe, oh, uh, I can answer or, or not. <laughs> I'll, 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 just, I'll, I'll just add this and I'm, I'm really appreciative of the earlier comments and I, I, I would add to that um, when I think about what faith-based organizations or communities can do, it, it's, it's using the power of, of our collective voice. To, to speak for justice, to actually extend hospitality to, to those in need, to use this as a means of, as a representation of the faith that cares for all. Um, and I think that's a critical thing. And I, I, sometimes I think churches think too little of themselves in that respect. Um, and then I think this is a critical way that, to move that forward. One of the things I, I, I've learned and, and from my own experience, um, Brian Stevenson, uh, who wrote Just Mercy, talks about the importance of proximity. I think too many of us live in very safe spaces and we aren't engaging in people who are different from us and whatever means different would mean. We need to push beyond our sort of safe spaces um, and engage folks who are different, um, who live different lives. And maybe it's politically or socially or economically, race, gender, um, um, whatever the difference may be, it's engaging because we don't understand, I think, one another's stories and we don't see the needs. And um, we, we heard about this earlier, that it's not in my community um, when it really is. The last thing I'll add, and I guess it's also partly because I work at a university and, and just been part of that. It's, it's using the educational institutions that we have. I mean, K through 12 and then the public and private institutions that are out there that provide educational opportunities. Using the resources that our federal government, our local and state governments have to encourage education to teach what's happening in our world around us. To encourage um, young people to think carefully critically and thoughtfully about the current world that we live in um, and to acknowledge the broad race uh, issues of race and history that play a part of our current day. These are critical uh, issues for us to consider and not to shy away from and to, to address in meaningful ways. Um, so I would love for our churches to find their voice in voicing and addressing issues of injustice. Um, I would love for our educational institutions to teach um, as much of the history that we can understand why we are where we are today so that we do not continue to perpetuate problems that have existed for generations. So those are a couple of things I think are, are, are critical for us to move these conversations forward. And I'll throw into the programs, uh, obviously, you know, the programs that I work with for churches, hey, CSA, uh, farmers market, pop-up markets, work with your local farmers in your community. 
Thank you. And just wanted to say that nobody asked Ray to make that pitch about making donations, but they are always appreciated. <laughs> Um, we have a um, long list of questions here to get through in the next 10 minutes. Um, so I'm just going to jump in and any, feel free to answer um, if you're compelled to do so. Uh, let's see here. I fully embrace a policy approach, but I am overwhelmed by the magnitude of the agribusiness system versus community awareness and involvement, which seems minimal in this issue. I appreciate the call to churches, but are there larger scale efforts? Another easy question. I would say, you know, um, even though the question is for a more larger view or, or larger way to be a part, don't negate the uh, impact that you can have, though you don't have that 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 larger stage to stand on. Again, just uh, supporting uh, organizations like ours and others that that work in this area um, is huge uh, for us because we rely on uh, the, the farmers that we work with, the consumers that we talk to, um, their customers that they work with, uh, to kind of drive um, not only our policy decisions, but but kind of share with those policymakers uh, that we may can get the ear of that that you feel like you may not uh, to share that story and share your story uh, and, and share it from your community. Okay, I'll just throw in really quickly that. Um... You know, one of the bigger, larger scale efforts is coming up in the National Farm Bill debates, um, which is, you know, once every four years, this big opportunity to, uh, yeah, um, advocate for, for changes. And there are numerous, both like local food policy organizations, national food policy organizations that um, you can plug into in different ways, I'm sure. Rafi is well connected in this space. If you're looking for touch points or recommendations, um, you're already, you know, by attending this conference, um, you know, in a part of that network. And I think can certainly reach out to anyone to find out what makes more sense for you. But there is absolutely um, a huge federal policy debate going on right now for the Farm Bill. Uh, and, you know, I would also be remiss to not plug some of the antitrust policy debates that are happening right now. It's getting, um, unprecedented focus from the Biden administration. There are numerous public comment periods um, open, like USDA has one open right now about concentration in uh, fertilizer, um, seeds and retail, and you know, seeking different comments on how that affects individuals and changes they would like to see. So yeah, I think there's definitely opportunities to to advocate on the federal level and that doesn't even cover the state level in which there's also ample opportunities. Claire, great point about the Farm Bill. You know, Rafi will be doing also some organizing uh, around that with some listening sessions. And then to my colleague, Margaret, I think has a session uh, at the conference as well, discussing and kind of intro to uh, Farm Bill. Great, do you wanna to add to that Dr. Wilson or should I move on to the next easy question? Next easy question. Claire stole my thunder. <laughs> the next easy question. Oh my God, I feel bad asking this. Can we reestablish parity in dairy farming? <laughs> no. Wow, that's, that's huge. And I, I feel like now that I have the mic, I, I really have to say something. <laughs> it's like, why did I say anything? <laughs> Oh, this is, I mean, it's, it's uh, even though we laugh, it is a, a challenging time for the dairy industry. It's been a challenging time for the last several years for the dairy industry. Um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm ever hopeful that we can uh, achieve a, a place uh, where dairy uh, farmers are able to do well, but it's, it's, there are some structural challenges, I think, going on in the dairy industry that need some serious consideration in order to see um, the industry adjust. And so, I, I'll answer the question saying I'm hopeful, but I, I do believe it's going to take um, some level of policy intervention and it's also going to take um, uh, changes in and sort of acknowledgement of the changes in, in consumer demand also that is, is taking place um, in dairy and it's, it's just not, it's not easy. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm stumbling on this question because it is just that it's, it's difficult. Um, I, I do have colleagues who are dairy economists who could probably talk to that a little bit more, but I'm, I'm not that guy <laughs> or person. 
Claire or Ray, do you have anything to add to that one? No, not really. I mean, like Dr. Wilson said, it's 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 a tough industry, and it's unfortunately it's one of those industries that uh, promoted going big or go home uh, fairly early. And we saw some of these small dairies go out, and then of course it's just very demanding on labor and time. Uh, you know, those cows got to be milked every twelve hours, and so a lot of our farmers, especially around here, you know, they just couldn't get their their children to to get interested and kind of take over as they aged out, and uh, very unfortunate. Okay, here we have a question for Ray from one of our attendees. What recommendations do you have for small farmers to increase their market share in the marketplace? I think um, uh, telling your story, getting, getting, getting it out there, um, learning how to market what you have, understanding your area that you're selling in. Um, you know, I talked to some farmers uh, this week up at the local Southern states and, you know, we're all talking about the area that we're in, everybody's still going to grow gardens. Uh, everybody's going to have sweet corn to come in at the same time because we all plant it at the same time. We're all going to have yellow squash and things. So we've kind of got to be a little more creative on some of the things that we're growing to establish um, a market for those. Um, look in a region level, don't just a regional level. Don't think just uh, like your county or your local farmer's market. Look for the needs around in your region. Um, here I am, we're very close to the Raleigh Durham market. Um, two hours from Richmond, Virginia, an hour from Greensboro. So we're always kind of just looking out of that little boundary area that we're willing to travel to, to see the needs and uh, try to adapt uh, kind of our planning uh, to meet those. Wonderful, thank you. Um, all right, let's go to another question. We have an interesting one here. Um, the question, it's a statement and they wanna know whether you agree or disagree with the following statement. In some ways, as processed food prices rise, it opens the door for locally sourced, more healthy food choices to be more competitive. Do you agree or disagree? And I can repeat it if that's helpful. I am torn. <laughs> um, I think, you know, It's like yes and yes and no. I think there's definitely an issue of um, you know where are people where are most people consuming their food? And I think these local fresh produce options that most people envision. We think of farmers markets, CSAs. You know, while those have grown dramatically in the past 10, 20 years, they still represent, I think barely 2% of all food sales, like they're, they're still quite marginal and still, um, you know, can be challenging for the average shopper to access. So I feel like it's, it's in order for some of those products to be competitive, I think they need to be um, into more, you know, mainstream markets where people are, are buying their food. Um, and, you know, where most people are, uh, finding their food. Um, that's something I think about, how can we break open those supply chains? So it's um, not always a question of, of price. You know, I think in many ways, there are some programs exist that can make local foods already price competitive, whether it's the double your dollars at um, farmer's markets or, um, you know, seasonal produce. Sometimes there's quite an abundance of it. And it can actually be cheaper than conventional produce. Yet there's a reason that it is challenging for a lot of people to access and a reason why it's not a large portion of sales. And so I think those are the questions that we need to be thinking about um, to make these foods truly available and accessible and competitive with processed foods, which are abundant and easy to find. And um, yeah, that's my initial reaction. I'm, I'm more of the mindset that um, as processed food prices uh, rise, we're going to see just general price inflation. So you're, you're going to see even fresh, healthy options still increase in price. Um, and how we as consumers respond to those price changes will also sort of be reflected in how high up uh, or how much more those prices will go up. I mean, um, and so so for that reason, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that you're going to see a reduction a reduction, if you will, in the gap, if, if, if there is one from fresh and healthy foods and 
uh, relative to to pro more processed products. I think you're going to see sort of a, a, a sort of increase across the board. Um, that may, however, give people some opportunities to look at products differently. Um, if they're seeing price rises, um, maybe it becomes one where the, the that it becomes more interesting for people to start thinking about some of these alternative uh, approaches. But I would say there is a critical part also of thinking about how do we want to approach the foods that we're consuming. Um, and that's a, a story that I think is critical for us to think through of, uh, are we willing to, to spend the time um, to do the work, to, to learn some of the techniques to uh, cook and to manage the foods that we bring to our house that may have a higher rate of, of, of waste. So I think, I think it's, it's a sort of a both end. There, there are gonna be prices and price increases that we are gonna face, but I also think we as consumers have uh, to make some choices about the ways that we want to navigate the food system um, that exists. Sorry, struggling with the mute button. Um, okay, the next question. Uh, many small livestock farmers I know who want to produce meat products to sell directly to consumers, but they can't because it is too risky or expensive to start small meat processing facility. Also, the regulatory hurdles are prohibitive. So the question is, how can we work to fix the hurdles that many small farmers face in order to scale and sell directly to consumers? Well, as a, a small livestock farmer myself with our pasture raised pork, I think it really depends on the area and if you're if you're lacking processing facilities. Uh, fortunately, where I am in, in North Carolina, there's quite a few processing facilities within a, in a driving distance. The problem we have now is they're having labor issues and we're having issues of getting getting animals scheduled to get processed. Um, so if you're in an area kind of like I am and you can get an appointment, I think it's advantageous because you know you go there. They're either uh, state or USDA inspected facilities. So um, once you bring the animal in alive and, and you go through your process for your state, if it's a meat handler's license requirement or whatnot for when you get that product back and how you um, refrigerate it or freeze it or, or, or maintain it as your inventory, uh, once you get those regulations down, which in North Carolina are, are, are not that very hard, um, but by going to that, that processing facility, um, uh, they handle kind of some of all those regulations that you're talking about. Their own farm processing or uh, further processing, and once you get it, then yes, there are quite a bit of regulations, uh, rightfully so, you know, to deal with uh, food safety uh, concerns. Thank you. Claire, Dr. Wilson, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's, there's a question of, like, very practically sort of what Ray is um, getting at like, how do you find processing? How do you maybe pool resources with other farmers to uh, start processing, which I hear a lot of farmers are interested in or, but also I think there's this question of once you have um, processing that is out there, especially these small and medium plants that exist, like how do you um, make sure they can make it and stay alive? And how do you have a fair playing field for these processors to grow and, um, succeed and that's where we have uh, the Packers and Stockyards Act, which is a fair competition law that specifically regulates fair dealing in the uh, food processing industry. And there's been many issues over the years um, with effectively regulating that law. There's a lot of focus on how the Packers and Stockyards Act regulates the relationships between farmers and meat processors to make sure they're getting fair terms, but it also regulates ways that um, meat processors can market their products, for instance, and can ensure that they're not engaging in things like exclusive dealing or unfair marketing practices that make it so they can lock up um, like access to schools and local institutions and key markets. So I think that is another um, policy lever that's actively sort of on the table and being reconsidered right now, where some stronger fair competition rules could be put in place to level the competitive playing field for uh, medium sized small processors. And it's, I guess, good to mention too about the um, meat and poultry processing expansion program and the grants that will be coming out through USDA to hopefully expand. Um, 
processing facilities or renovate processing facilities near you. Thank you, Ray. Well, that was our last question uh, in this panel. I want to thank all three of our panelists. Um, before I pass it on to Justine, just wanted to mention that this, we tried to cover essentially all of the challenges in the food system in 45 minutes and pose some really hard questions. Um, so I encourage folks to check out our website um, and learn more about the many issues that we talked about.